okay, back online, even for people remote. Okay, so that's the agenda for today. So to start, a few words about our program. So that's really busy, and it's on purpose is really busy, reflecting the fact that we typically engage with 35, 40 projects at one time. So again, no way that I can talk about all of that. So we, but what kind of the, the, the message here that we develop new concepts in radiation detection on the top left, such as uh, scene data fusion you see here, making radiation visible, or the nucleus street view. Again, you know, the 3D street view, what we can now do is to map radiation and integrate radiation into the nucleus street view in 3D. Uh, so going from concepts reflecting hardware and software developments all the way to application deployment. So we not only develop new concepts in our lab, we make, we make detectors, we build systems, we put them on platforms that you can see here from systems to put them on platforms and deploy them across the world, whether it's in Fukushima, whether it's in Ukraine, for example, at Chernobyl, or in many different facilities around the world in the United States. Always keep in mind that we want to drive technological innovation and developments to, in, to enhance or enable new applications, but also keep in mind that also applications and new developments drive scientific discoveries and applications as well. So we're always in this kind of dependence in this from development of new concepts to applications. Now, we also, our, our, our program entails the semiconductor fabrication lab where we make detectors, semiconductor detectors that goes back to the 60s, this lab, certainly before my time as well, where kind of semiconductor were developed. Silicon, germanium, calcium, telluride, they were developed six days, partially in this lab. Also the scintillation engineering lab, the scintillator engineering lab, where we even grow new crystals and make scintillation detectors. It's part of our program. All underpinned with data analytics, again, machine learning. And we have now all the sensors out there, which is radiation, but also contextual sensors, which allows us to, to apply really advanced algorithms. The Berkeley Data Cloud is part of our program where we are uh, able now to uh, not only measure a lot of, uh, perform a lot of measurements, creating data from, from systems out in the world, but ultimately manage that and make it available to the uh, community, to all of you. And we also uh, have the Berkeley Red Watch program, which is part of our outreach program, where we work with schools and communities um, to allow them to learn more about nuclear. Okay, so that's also part of our program, mainly driven by, by UC Berkeley. Funded by a lot of different institutions, organizations over the last plus 10 years. So in the following, I want to mention, to pick up some, some pieces of that. Okay, no way to, to, to discuss all the different developments, just some selected pieces, you'll see. Now, this is our team. As I mentioned, we're about 30 scientists. This is a view from our patio in, at Berkeley Lab. Again, it's quite appealing. So we have a building, we have a patio, we have a nice view over the bay. As a matter of fact, this is the Golden Gate Bridge there. And right after the, right after the Golden Gate Bridge is actually Fukushima. So it is interesting that the latitude of Berkeley is the same as Daiichi nuclear power plant. That means if the world would be flat, we would see it. Which is kind of relevant because we had a lot of visitors from Japan because I've been engaging, I've been to Fukushima more than, more than 20 times and a lot of visitors from Fukushima. So always saying, okay, the only thing which, con which, which uh, uh, separates us is water. 5,000 miles of water, but it's just water. So we are pretty much neighbors. It's kind of important when you engage with them that we're actually neighbors. And because whatever happens in Japan, we will see it. And our group was actually the first one to measure the, the release of radioactivity outside of Japan. But right? within an hour of the predictions, we were able to see perfect fission spectra. In the rain, we were able to observe. Okay, so that's, that's us, okay, in a, in a nutshell. So I wanted to say more broader lecture about the, what is relevant for us in our field is the evolution of radiation detection and imaging, just with some examples which is a fairly linear evolution. Again, you can argue about the scale, whether the log scale or whatever scale. There's some scale where you have an evolution of different radiation detection uh, uh, methodologies, starting with fluorescence film. Again, that's how uh, uh, Marston uh, and Geiger and in Rutherford's lab in Manchester in 1908 actually discovered the nucleus. 
right? But just sitting in the dark and counting flashes of light, like fluorescence form. That was 1908. Of course, a little before, Röntgen, of course, discovered X-rays in 1895 by accident. That's why he called it X-rays. So, but this uh, defined pretty much a whole new field of X-ray imaging we're still utilizing. So that's the start of radiation detection. And then I want to just to focus on radionuclide imaging, okay, um, because we're a little biased in, in Berkeley, where we have Hal Anger to, the, uh, to develop the Anger camera in the 50s. And before we have uh, Benedict Kasten already at UCLA with a rectilinear scanner, because in 1948, sodium iodide was developed with a PMT. So the first time you have a spectroscopy system. And what Kasten did in UCLA, in 1948, 1949, already just to have a collimator in front of a scintillator and just scan it over, over an, uh, for example, a patient with had iodine to for thyroid uptake, for example, studies. So that was 1950s. So the concept is still very similar, even though now more recently we have the, we then had the developments of new detector materials, BGO, LSO, LYSO, to enable fairly sensitive PET and SPEC imaging systems. The latest is total body PET, of course, which was developed in UC Davis uh, a few years ago. Uh, quite a remarkable evolution of, of, of technologies for radiation detection and imaging. Uh, why I have Alice here? Because in terms of number of channels, they're actually comparable. So what you have now in your scanner is almost like an, uh, a, a large-scale physics experiment with their own challenges. So linear evolution, OK, number one. Number two, of course, computing is now more and more relevant of course, collecting data, computing capabilities. And of course, that's much more exponential. We all know the Moore's law. Uh, going back to the first computers, like for example, the Manchester baby or Z1, which is the mechanical implementation of a computer in the 30s, ENIAC here in the United States. So amazing 1,000 operations per second, like one kilobyte, 1,000 one, 1, bits. Uh, that's what was the first computer to do actually using registers and the first time computers in the 30s and 40s. Of course, now we have, and this is not even the latest, that's A14, now we have the A17, I think, now coming on. But it's similar numbers. Like now we have 10 to the 9 transistors, we have 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 operation per second. And that's not even the, the neural machines, okay? So that's now even more, that's now trillions of, of operation per second possible in your pocket. So clearly exponential. However, in parallel, sensor technology also underwent an exponential growth starting, in my opinion, with George uh, Eastman, like the, the first pocket-sized camera in 1888, right, where he actually invented a pocket camera, the first time that anyone can take a picture. And then he commercialized it, of course, and Kodak founded Kodak 1892. So this is then with him and, and Thomas Edison in 1928, where he used that also for filming. Again, first photograph, pocket photograph, picture camera, and movie. Right? That's essential. That's really important for us of, as a starting point. Then the cameras, digital cameras, CCD sensors, CMO sensors, everything we have in our pocket. Enormous revolution, pretty much, on sensor technologies. And then WADA, of course, the fact that you can now sense distances driven by the Second World War to detect vessels or submarines or aircrafts with radar developed in the 40s. Is still now, instead of having these old radars, now you can get a little chip, which does it for you. And it's not that expensive. And we can utilize it to map the world around us in radar. Or you can do LIDAR. Any autonomous system, right now you go out there, like autonomous cars, they have LIDAR systems, a laser range finder, which can determine distances to objects in 3D very effectively. Okay, so that's also an enormous driver of technologies and sensor technology enabling autonomous self-driving cars, for example. And then you have other developments, of course, uh, edge computing and on uh, networks 5G, which allow now to really go from the edge to the cloud. There's no difference anymore. And robotics on control. So that's kind of our system we are using for our deployments. Okay. So we have the more linear development of radiation, we have the exponential development of computing and sensing. Of course, what we want to do, we want to combine both to really to benefit us in radiation detection, but utilizing both. And that's what I want to discuss now in our work by utilizing the enormous advances on one hand, driving radiation detection and imaging, but utilizing the really revolution 
in sensor technology and data processing capabilities. And I want to illustrate that was a specific, again, the concept of scene data fusion we have developed over the last 10 years. So that's still the baseline. If you go to Fukushima, any contaminated areas, you still find people, the operators, if something happens with a, with a Gaia counter or a sodium iodide handheld detector going into the contaminated area as this person and do a measurement of a dose rate at that location. If it's advanced, it has an iPhone or iPad, which has a GPS, and you can just write down the dose rate at that location. That's still state of the art. Now, what we can do is that. Okay, so you can now, with our sensor systems, which we call the scene data fusion concept, you can walk and fly your system through an environment, like exactly the bamboo forest in Nami town, which is still one of the evacuated areas in Fukushima, and just walk or fly down and get the full 3D reconstruction and the 3D mapping of your contamination in that area. So that is possible now. What is interesting is that two of my former students, Ross Banowski and Andy Hefner, were actually driving one of the drivers of these developments, initially using a Microsoft Connect, like in 2011, when the first rangefinder came online and affordable. So that's actually the system we we went to Fukushima first in 2013, which is Microsoft Connect. Of course, the problem you have to do it at dark at night because there's have a thermal uh, infrared uh, uh, rangefinder, so it doesn't really work during the day. But so this is already a little bit advanced version. So that's possible now. So what I want to describe now, of course, you have the full digital reconstructions. That means you can, for example, remove buildings and can zoom in and to clarify the visibility of of contamination. And again, this all is done within 50 minutes just to map that whole area in the contamination. So how does it work? Okay, so how, what, does it, what is needed to make that possible, this 3D mapping? On one hand, we have compact gamma ray imaging systems, and we want to image gamma rays over a large range of energies, like from 80 kV, 60 kV, all the way to several emitters. Okay, with that, we have to realize that there are different processes interaction processes of gamma rays of photons with matter. So for lower energies, the photoelectric absorption is dominating. At higher energies, you have quantum scattering dominating. Okay, that means if you want to build sensitive imaging system, you need to take that into account. On one hand, on lower energies, we use collimator-based systems because we are relying on photoelectric absorption. So we can use that to absorb for example, on a collimator, your, your, your photon, but using, it in this, but using our collimator in a smart way, so particularly we do it as a coded aperture. A coded aperture is fundamentally a range of pinhole. I mean, pinhole, okay, it's a very simple collimator system. But now what happens if you add many more of these pinholes, this mask or the aperture mask, so that means every hole projects a unique, has a, creates a unique projection on the back plane of your detector. That means you can code now the position of your source in front of the aperture uh, uniquely in two dimensions with an opaqueness or a transmission of 50%. Okay, so that's kind of the compromise. Now you can do that with a passive collimator. That's been conventionally used, but you can also do it with an active absorber. Right? So just detect the elements as your, as your back plane and as your uh, collimator plane. So that's coded aperture, which works for low energy of photons. For high energy photons, we have to rely on Compton scattering. So now we have to um, develop and deploy detectors which can reconstruct the track of a gamma ray within the detector. That means we can reconstruct the interactions. We can interact, we can reconstruct the three dimensional positions and the energies of each interaction. So that allows us to track the gamma ray and reconstruct the, the, the angle um, to a cone of your, or the, the, the line of incident to a cone surface. And we do that by utilizing Compton scattering formula. One hand, we have the first two interactions. So the first two interactions define the symmetry axis of cone. And then the energy of the first, in first interaction compared to the, over the total energy, allows us to define the Compton scattering angle. Like on each event, we are able to reconstruct the incident direction to a cone. But now if you have many of those cones, they intersect in a position. And that's your location of the source. 
Okay, that's how Compton imaging and Compton cameras operate, requiring a three-dimensional position sensitive detector. So, but that's required if you want to map 50 kV to several entities. So they have to operate in these two different imaging modalities. Okay, absorber-based photoelectric absorption, scattering-based Compton imaging systems. So that's what we have developed. Initially, uh, we call it uh, HEMI, so High Efficiency Multimode Imager, which consists of cat telluride detectors, cubic centimeter cat telluride, operated in so-called coplanar grid configuration to improve the energy resolution. But each voxel, each detector, represents pretty much one voxel in your imager. But we have an active plane of these detectors, which is kind of our aperture, but it's not passive anymore, but it's active material of our active absorber plane. And then we have a plane in the back, okay, as our absorber. So we can operate that as a coded aperture, like if we have put sources uh, and lower energies, like three, we can resolve that based on the, the, the mapping and the projection, the unique projection through this coded aperture and operate in active mode. But we can use then both planes also for do Compton image. Like because we have the precision, uh, each voxel provides the precision, and you use scattering on all, on all detectors. So we also have a fairly efficient Compton imager. So we have in our dual mode system, like coded aperture plus Compton imager, using only active elements. That means if you want to have a a system that you can carry around or you can put on a drone, you don't, now you don't need any passive material. It's all active. That's, you don't throw away any information of, of gamma ray interaction with, for example, with your passive mask. So it's quite elegant. So that's how we started. Again, you see the Microsoft Connect, so that's Andy Hefner already in 2012, 2013, where we combined this Hemi imager with a, the with a Microsoft Connect. So that's how we started with the scene data fusion, again, more than 10 years ago. But it allows us to, to demonstrate the concept of com combining coded aperture and common imaging with only active elements. So that's number one, okay, the, the image itself. Now, number two is, and what you can do now, you can put your imager somewhere in space and you can just wait and ultimately co collect these, 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 these interactions and you can create a two-dimensional image. Like you can put it somewhere and you can have several companies now to do that, whether it's H3D, from our colleague Zhang He, or whether Easton Hall with PhDs and germanium. So they are now commercially Compton imaging system or coded aperture system you put somewhere and you can collect and you can get these images. But again, what I showed you before is more than that because we are now able being, to move the system freely through an environment to map the environment. That means what we want to do is we want to reconstruct, for example, this volume, but we want to now move our detector, our Compton imager, for example, to an environment freely and to reconstruct the position. So how can we do that? How can we now track the, our system in our scene, in our environment, so we can reconstruct uh, a source configuration by having a freely moving system? Okay. Again, that's where now the advances in computer vision come into play. So whether it's photogrammetrically, so that's supposed to be a, a movie, like whether you have like a, 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 a monoc monocular camera you can move around to reconstruct photogrammetrically an object in 3D. That's the uh, Chernobyl uh, claw. That was the claw which was used to remove the debris in 1986, 1987 in Chernobyl. Like it's, it's 10 feet high, three meter high, it's a big claw which was used and it's sitting there in Pripyat. Anyone who ever goes there right now, right? there's a war going on right now, but in principle you can just go there and watch it and use a dosimeter to count. Okay, we went there with our system to do the full 3D reconstruction. So that's one way to get the 3D reconstruction. Or you can use a LiDAR, like now the rotating LiDAR. And this is kind of a movie of our building in 50C and LBL with our patio. So you can reconstruct the scene in 3D. But in addition now, you can use what we call SLAM, simultaneous localization mapping. That means now with the point cloud itself you create, you can also estimate where you are in that cloud in the scene you're creating where you are and what the orientation of your system is. So that's what SLAM does for you. Okay, so now you can estimate, not only can you get the 3D scene around you, you can also estimate where you are and what the orientation of your system is in the scene you're just creating. So that's what autonomous cars do all the time. But now we can adapt that and ultimately 
utilize that using, again, this package, the LIDAR package, compared with our gamma ray imaging system and a compact platform, you can put it on a drone. So the drone flies around, creates this 3D map. So that's the real map, that's Brian Creter, one of our senior scientists. So you can, this is Richmond Field Station, like an area you can fly in our environment. We put a source here in this building, so we can fly, we can create a 3D scene. We can now estimate the scene, we can, um, and we can estimate where we are on the drone. And now we can utilize that to reconstruct the location. And which is really powerful because now this is your reconstruction space, right? Because you know you project back on your surfaces you just created. Also in, in terms of your image reconstruction processing and accuracy in the reconstruction, that's really powerful. It's like in, in CT, in, in medical imaging, if you have an anatomy. So this is pretty much your anatomy you just uh, uh, observed in your system. And you can use that to back project. Okay, and that allows us, again, more than simple back projection. Of course, we are running multi different, more advanced image reconstruction methodologies. You can ultimately detect the source sitting there across the year. We have the all spectrometers, fine, we can identify, and we can ultimately localize in 3D while we are having the, the drone flying around the building. And it comes really fairly close to reconstruction to the, to the actual building. Okay, so these are the different components to, to enable the C data fusion or the mapping and visualization in 3D in real time on any platform. Because it doesn't care whether it's on a ground robot, whether it's on a drone, whether it's in hand portable configuration, or you put it on a, on a car, on a truck, or in a manned helicopter. It will always work because it tracks itself automatically. So this is now supposed to be the animation of that claw, which might not work, unfortunately. Again, I, I'm using Mac and you know, this good old Mac PC problem. So this is supposed to be an animation of this claw, the 3D animation, but ultimately that's what we can do now. So we have this claw, the reconstruction, with centimeter resolution, and we can reconstruct CSO 137, for example, where are Compton imaging. So where the, where the contamination is. And we can do that within minutes. What you can see, for example, after 30 plus years, most of the contamination of cesium is now down on the ground. And it's about 0.4 millisievert power. So it's quite warm, so you shouldn't spend too much time within the claw. But that's, that's what is now possible. And then actually that was possible 2018 when we actually went there. So that was possible five years ago already. Now, you can go in other areas because you, for example, the, the circ pumps in, in some unit two, I think that was unit two, where we are able to really do the full mapping over tens and hundreds of meters. Again, you just walk through the environment. And you, I mean, at the end, so you can get, hopefully, yep, you actually get the, so this is the, the, the circ pumping, uh, the, again, about 50 meters. You go to the, the central square in Pripyat Town Center, and you walk through, so you have the path itself, and you get the full 3D reconstruction. Okay, this is the path, and that's what you reconstruct. You can reconstruct over here, you can reconstruct over here. So on a large scale, you can get the 3D reconstructions. For example, here what you see is the fountains, like where the water was still going for some time and accumulates. Actually, you see also accumulation of CZ-137, which we have found in Fukushima as well. All the drains and all where water accumulates and foliage accumulates, that's where you have still the hot spots. And you can do that, localize that just by walking or flying through. So one thing I want to mention here, if you look at that, it right, looks like a digital twin. Again, what you're creating automatically in Handley is a digital twin. Right? You don't really have to design, you just take the point cloud from this facility and you have a digital twin. Again, it's quite, quite powerful. So that's also for the future something we're exploring. So there's a lot more to be done with that. So since then, we have, so that's how we started. Again, that's a system with a, with a, uh, uh, an, a lot of different implementations of this kind of uh, uh, SDF systems. And we also put it on a lot of different platforms. So we can carry it around. You can put it on all kinds of ground vehicles or manned vehicles, whether it's a manned helicopter, the RMX helicopter, or, or, or um, the drones. So again, works on all these, 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 these systems. And you can create a lot of really feature-rich 3D images. Again, for a lot of application, whether it's for detection, for, for mapping, in a lot of, when you, as, a, as a consequence management, like in, when you have an emergency response, something happens, you want to access the environment very fast for decontamination, 
where you find decommissioning for decommissioning, monitoring nuclear power plants. So enormous amount of applications of that technologies. That's what kind of what I want to illustrate here. Uh, that's now uh, one of Andy, I mentioned Andy Hefner, who is always has to be more entrepreneurial. So he actually uh, spun off this technology and created a company. Um, so GRI Gamma Reality Incorporated uh, three years ago. And so this is now one of these commercial systems on a spot dock. So that's Boston Dynamics quadruped, uh, quadruped uh, uh, um, dock, which can you can you can drive from anywhere. So that's why a re radio, you can you don't have to be there, you put somewhere safe. And that's not possible. So you have that dock with a 3D mapper and you can reconstruct the whole BART station. So that's a subway station in the area. And you can map that and find hidden sources. While you're sitting safely somewhere to get the full 3D reconstruction and get also localization, the, uh, the identification of the sources in 3D. And that's now state of the art because that's now commercially available, these systems. So quite, quite powerful what you, can, what you can do now. By again, merging the advances in radiation detection imaging and computer vision. So the point I want to make here, that's important for us, it did not happen overnight. Even though now you see more and more groups to discover that, that the power. But when you start with these things, it takes some time because you have to develop yourself. And of course, all the parallel development of, of the computer vision also it needs to be done in parallel. Like we started 2012 again with the Microsoft Connect like because LiDAR didn't exist. Of course, and slowly adapted more and more of the advances in the in computer vision as well, but it takes time. So that's how we started 20 years ago, exactly. Rick Lenoll actually was my first Schubert reviewer, like Schubert review again, that's a more like internal joke, a joke with, with the NA22 reviews. So that was my first Schubert review with Lenoll being the, <laughs> being the chair of the committee. Uh, interesting experience. Um, because again, that's a longer story, but they ended up again with, it, with for security purposes. It was 2003. Again, that's after 9 11, 2001, where there had a lot of money suddenly appearing to develop advanced concepts in, in, in nuclear security. Again, imagine 9 11 happened and they, there were some radioactivity materials on the airplanes. I mean, it was a disaster already as is, but imagine there would be radioactivity, any amount of radioactivity materials on these airplanes. Manhattan, New York would have been evacuated. So that would have been even more disaster. But just realizing that about the impact and the sensitivity of nuclear is, is enormous. So that's, of course, sparked then the establishment of Homeland Security, Department of Homeland Security, the domestic, you know, nuclear, the domestic, uh, domestic nuclear detection office, all of that. So also for my career, that was actually because I was supposed to be doing biomedical imaging 20 years ago at a group in Livermore, but then that happened. So point is, we we're able in Livermore at that point uh, to build a double-sided strip germanium detector as a Compton camera, which is not new. Again, even CompTEL, like a gamma ray telescope flew in space already in the 90s. So the concept of Compton camera is not new at all. There was a, even a space mission already in, in, the, in, the, in the 1990s. But the fact that we're able to make a fairly compact Compton camera based on germanium detectors, and that's actually all done in-house at Livermore at that time. So we built the detector, read out all of that. And also realizing contextual information. So we put it on the card, added a visual camera. So that was available 2003 and moved it out in the world. Okay, so this is now the outside four pi image, the first outside four pi image ever done. Okay, gamma ray image ever done outside in the world. Um, and again, reflect the fact that we have compact four pi comp cameras. And we have visual imagery we can use to, to, to integrate both. So what you can see, well, it's not much. The main emphasis is, okay, you see higher, it's higher activity here, uh, and you have less, of course, in sky, which is not surprising. Right? But you have to tell the background on the ground, not so much in the sky. So that's what Kalenol actually liked very much, and he used that image a lot. Just realizing the, the, the power now of, of this, of, of gamma ray imaging going out, or in the, of course, in the lab too. Like again, combining visual imagery, just overlapping that is really powerful if you want to detect something and localize something. So that's how we started. 
Then we were lucky enough a few days later get from IEE a laser scanner. So that was the really very expensive single beam laser scanner. We had access to that and that allowed us to move the systems through a lab and reconstruction object through fairly high resolution. So that's the reconstruction of European 152 in a, in a pipe. Okay, so that was the first kind of 3D reconstruction. And then we had uh, the uh, Microsoft Connect, okay, as I mentioned before, that allows us to, to, to move our system through the lab into the more real-time reconstruction. And then we have uh, really more the hand portable system. And then we put it on an on a, on a airy vehicle. Uh, this is our etchery hall. So that's a 3D reconstruction of kind of etchery our, of our campus and using the information to reconstruct the cesium source on top of our building on one flyby. Again, we have, uh, then we went to small compact systems, put it on a, on a drone. And then we used, instead of just using coplanar grid detectors, we used CLBPC detectors. So that's a new generation of scintillators, which are not only sensitive to gamma rays, but also to neutrons. So because at the end, you can do that not only for gamma rays, but you can do that for neutrons. That means you can now reconstruct neutron sources in 3D. Because you can, how we arrange these detectors, you can also arrange the CLBPC detectors. That means you can get a coded aperture for neutrons as well. So we have now developed, and I'll show you that in a second, how we actually do that. You can also map neutrons in 3D. Okay, so gamma rays, neutrons at the same time. So that's what we did in 2019 to demonstrate that. So again, sponsor was really happy about that, that because if they have a heavily shielded source, you might not be able to really shield the neutrons so much other than the gamma rays. So one word about the evolution. So that was a system also in detectors because that's what we do in Berkeley. Uh, we drive the nuclear detection and imaging capabilities by leveraging the enormous advances in computer vision and integrate it. But what we are driving in terms of our research is radiation detection and imaging. So the HEMI I showed you before, that's always our starting point. And being a little smarter than people maybe before in terms of arranging only active elements to, in, to, to enable comp imaging and coded aperture at the same time. And we actually put it then on the Armex helicopter uh, for the first 3D mapping in Fukushima. That was 10, 10, 10 years ago. But then we thought, okay, can we be smarter than this system? Because one of these systems, uh, this is two planes, the conventional way of, 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 an, of an imager. You always have a collimator and a, and, a, and a plane. That's the conventional way of imaging. The problem is that is that your field of view is very limited because you're limited, of course, by the projection of the collimator on your detector. Can you be smarter in a way? Can you arrange all the detectors on a sphere and still maintain unique coding from all the directions in four pi. So when we started with that, and now also like eight or nine years ago, it was not really clear that it would work, but we were able with a smart student to develop an arrangement of these detectors so that you can get a unique coding in four pi. Okay, that every detector serves as a mask and a detector simultaneously. That's pretty cool that it actually works. So in that regard, we can improve, of course, the imaging capabilities because now we have a four pi coded aperture system. And by the way, Compton imaging improves too because the distance between the voxels on average is much larger than with, this, with the two planes. So we even improve the Compton imaging capabilities with that system. So we build it. So it was Dan Helfeld's actually thesis. So he was the guy who demonstrated that it actually works. We built that system. Again, that's the advantage we have at Berkeley. Can we can build these systems and we uh, demonstrate it in a hand portable fashion. Okay, and we actually won an R&D 100 for that as well. But the, okay, so that was a big step forward. But this was too heavy to put on a drone. So again, can we modify the arrangement? Can we now more to a cubic arrangement? So a three-dimensional cubic arrangement of these detector elements to still maintain Compton imaging coded aperture. So that's what this is. So instead of having 100 plus elements, we go down to maybe 30 to 60 only elements. Again, coplanar grid, still detectors, not pixelated, just coplanar grid, which is getting 10 degree resolution, as good as you can get even with pixelated systems, but only with coplanar grid cat satellite detectors, but arranged in a cube, which is much lighter weight. So very compact systems we can put on the door and still maintain coded aperture and common imaging with only active elements. So most weight efficient way to, 
to operate these systems and still maintaining omnidirectional four pi uh, directional uh, uh, imaging. And then the next step. Okay, so that was still for gamma rays only, but now utilizing the El Paso light revolution. Like we have actually now scintillators, which are pretty good gamma ray detectors, about typically 3%, which for scintillator relative energy resolution is pretty good, but has lithium-6 in it too. So it's extremely sensitive to thermal, for thermal neutron detection. It's pretty much plaque for thermal neutrons. So can we use the same concept, uh, but instead of using the cubic centimeter four planar grid cut centauri detector, uh, uh, instead of that, can we use the CLBC? And the answer is yes, we can do that and can maintain the gamma ray imaging capability over a wide range of energies, but at the same time, they can do neutron imaging. Okay, so this is a neutron imaging system, very compact neutron imaging using active masks only. And that, by the way, also had another R&D 100 award, which also can fly. What is really nice on this system is that um, because we developed the whole system, not except the detectors, so this is radiation monitoring devices, RMD, Panay Shah at that point, it's happy to provide that. So that's all, but everything else, the mechanical and the, and the readout, the control, all was done in-house. And by Josh Cates at the end, one of our scientists, which allowed us to go to really high count rates of this system for gamma rays and for neutrons. But what you can, for example, what you can show here, the system, so high rate, so we can go up to 10 mega counts per second, 10 million counts per second, which is in radiation detection, very high count rate that you can operate that on a single event in pulse mode for gamma rays and for neutrons. Okay, so for, uh, we did that measurement in Savannah River Lab, as Savannah in, in National, uh, in Savannah River uh, National Lab, where we actually didn't even know about the neutrons there. So we discovered some neutron contamination, which was pretty high because it was up to 10 megacons per second, just the neutrons, while maintaining the energy resolution. Okay, so this is a gamma ray from uh, palladium. So that's also from, uh, uh, again, one of their processing facilities. This is the thermal neutron peak. Okay, 3.2 MeV, that's a neutron capture on lithium-6. You see that factoscopy. Now you can do that in this way for thermal neutrons, but you can also even do PST. So you have the thermal neutrons here, you have the fast neutrons because of the chlorine, and you have gamma rays. Again, you have a dry model system, you can use that for detection and for imaging. And since you have the timing now too, so you can actually do some timing between the gamma rays and neutrons. So you can do the coincidence and can ultimately learn something about the source itself by looking at the timing of the gamma ray versus neutrons. So this system is pretty powerful, what you can do. All right, so that's all I want to say in terms um, of see data fusion, our efforts in terms of nuclear detection developments, radiation imaging developments, and utilizing again, the enormous advances to inform our scene data fusion. But there's much more you can do. For example, this is now scene data fusion, but it allows us to estimate quantities because now we have distances. We can now infer some information about the context, about the materials itself, so estimating attenuation. It allows us to estimate source strengths or dose rates. Okay, so, so you can even utilize again, computer vision to allow us to estimate uh, the, the elements uh, of, of objects and to estimate uh, attenuation in these objects. So we can go out in the world to map the world and uh, in 3D and can start to segment them. So why would we do that? Now, if you're out going out of the world, you want to detect really weak sources, shielded sources. You cannot do much about your signal itself because that might be shielded in whatever form. What you can do because it's a signal to background problem, like any detection problem is a signal to background problem. What you can do is to better estimate background. So that's what we have also invested a lot of time over the last 10 years to better understand background. So one of our scientists, Mark Benstler, uh, was an astrophysicist joining our program like 15 years ago, and he is really the expert on backgrounds. And, uh, and because there's a lot of information in our world we can estimate if you have computer vision tools. So this is uh, several blocks of Berkeley, and that's a segmented uh, block in Berkeley. So it's segmented in terms of the different building types and cars and all of that. And now you can, what you can do now, you can associate every of these segments like these classes with background radiation. Because you have some prior information 
how an active in tree is a certain concrete building, wooden building, your asphalt. You can estimate what the radioactivity is. And having the segments, having the, segment, the, the segmented, um, you can now estimate that like, based on the surface is what the emission would be. And therefore you can now go out and predict potentially what the background will be. So enormous progress using computer vision to estimate background before you go in the environment or understand the background you're associated. And background is very complicated, it changes all the time, spatially, temporally. So background is pretty complicated, but having these contextual sensors out there helps you to really inform your detection algorithm. And that's why it comes into play detection algorithm, because now you have all the sensor information. That's where machine learning comes in, because there's a lot of data out there you can utilize to estimate background and to estimate ultimately the source and what the source is. Because what machine learning always needs is data, data, data. And that's what we can do. The point is, it's not even sufficient. So we're actually now creating syn synthetic models to get even more data you can utilize then for machine learning. Okay, that's what I want to say here, machine learning. Then also we can do now uh, in terms of labeling of objects, tracking of objects. Um, you can go in environments where you have moving cars, moving objects. You can, you can identify, you can track them, and you can associate specific signatures in your detector with specific objects moving by also increasing detection capabilities anomalies and education and, and uh, adjudication because you know what specific object or car caused a certain alarm and that's really relevant that you know okay this car was actually the one with the source and not another car in complex environments and you can use of course make use of the advances in mixed reality whether it's augmented or virtual reality uh, whether you want to go in an environment with aug augmented uh, uh, reality or you want to control the system, for example, now this tone remotely through the VR interfaces. Because you can create this scene in 3D automatically and you can visualize it through VR uh, pretty much in real time. So that's what we have demonstrated as well. You can ultimately operate this drone remotely through your VR and can create these models remotely in 3D and with your virtual reality environment. So quite powerful what you can do. Again, by leveraging the enormous advances in computer vision, including mixed reality. Okay, so to my last theme in a way, um, is a parallel pass more focused on germanium detectors because germanium detectors have been around for a long time. And I just want to argue that there's still a lot of work that can be done and a lot of new development can be utilized with, with germanium detectors. So I showed you, this is where we started 2003. So that's a double-sided strip germanium detector. Okay, so a piece of germanium with strips, orthogonal strips on each side. And that provides the three-dimensional position information because the strips plus the timing provides three-dimensional position of gamma ray interactions. And the different path from there, from 2003, on one hand, because Ethan Hull made actually the first detectors. So he then started his own company, PhDs. Still, this is kind of a hand portable gamma ray imaging system based on germanium. We are now building germanium detectors for the next generation gamma ray telescope. So NASA is supporting the development, the, the construction of a gamma ray telescope. That means imaging nuclear events um, uh, in space by using germanium detectors and Compton imaging. Like this kind of the medium uh, range, energy range, like from, from hundreds of keV to several MeV, if you want to image processes in, this, in, the, in our universe, this is the next generation of systems and we are building the detectors for that. Okay, so that's really the best you can do right now in compact imaging and very efficient because these detectors are pretty big. That's a nice box of germanium detectors, which will be hopefully launched in 2027 as a next generation gamma ray telescope for NASA. We also, that's what we're doing. So we're also driving another angle for these detectors to operate them in high count rates. Okay, so germanium detectors typically are limited because of the shaping you need to do to obtain this really ultra, very high energy resolution. So we develop new concepts to modify these detectors to allow us to operate these detectors with mega counts per second. So that's quite relevant because now if you want, can operate your detector with like 0.2 to 0.3% relative energy resolution at mega counts per second, this is quite interesting if you have environments where you have a lot of radiation. For example, if there's something goes on like in consequence management, emergent response, where you really want to find out the isotopics and energy resolution of, of, of paramount, 
or monitoring nuclear power uh, facilities, like where now some of the more advanced concept, you want to look at spent fuel, or you want to, for example, look at pebbles, like, but you want to operate, you need to operate these detectors a megahorn per second, but still maintaining 0 0.2, 0 0.3% energy resolution. So that's quite intriguing for to in the, or motivating for this system. In particular, you can use it, these detectors also for nuclear physics experiments. That's all I want to say here. So, and you can potentially use these detectors, and that's really moving to my last topic of today, um, because you have fairly large volumes, you have good energy resolution, you can operate them as an imager, you can also use them for um, uh, near field small animal image. Okay, that brings me to uh, the last, again, last topic related to the promise of high linear energy transfer cancer therapy. Two specific uh, applications we have been working on. One related, I mean, both related, of course, to high LAT, also related then to high relative biological effectiveness. That means we have, you have ions using ions, whether it's alpha particles, um, for the radio pharmaceuticals, which is called um, target alpha therapy. We're using the alpha particle to do the damage to ultimately kill the cancer, which is really different a little bit too. For example, if you want to beta particles or OG electrons. So alpha particles really are the sweet spot because the range of alpha particles is about tens of micrometer. So it's an extension of the human cell. Okay, so that means one particle is very effective in, in killing on the cell level. Um, and again, you have five MeV, so a lot of energy. You can deposit in over, 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 over 30, 40, 50, 60 micrometer. So it's quite appealing for treating cancer. So that's certainly what they've been pushing, of course, really about by our colleague here, it was really nice work because, so that's one. And then the, 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 the other one also related to ILAT is going away from photon, external photon treatment to protons using ultimately the specific energy loss features of protons to be more effective in killing cancer. Okay, so that has become a state of the art for, for, for cancer treatment. It's not Protons, but using protons. Now, both of them come with challenges. Okay, and on one hand, they're extremely effective in killing cells, but both of them come with some challenges in terms of making sure that you actually kill the cancer and not the healthy tissue, which is right next to the cancer tissue. It's all related to the verification on the biokinetics of these, of these, of these modalities. In that regard, they are quite similar in the challenge, even though they're quite different. In target alpha therapy, you want to make sure that your, the alpha particle with the pharmaceutical is actually ending up in their cancer and not in healthy tissue. The problem with that, with target alpha therapy specifically in Actinium 225 is one of the really promising radionuclides, which is now being used for target alpha therapy, that is so effective that it does, it's not emitting many gamma rays because the dose you need or the activity you need is not millicurie anymore, but it's more like 0.5 microcurie, like a factor of 1,000 less than you normally use because it's so effective. But that's a problem now if you want to verify the biokinetics, like you have, you're starving photons. For protons, there, you want to really make sure that the PREC creek, that the photons stop in the cancer and not in normal tissue. Okay, that means there you want to determine the range to a millimeter. Ideal in every spot, because normally you have raster scans of the proton beams in cancer, and you adjust, well, you, be, you scan it through and by, by having spots, and they're typically 10, 70 milliseconds. So you, you raster scan with 70 milliseconds. So ideally, within 70 milliseconds, you want to know what the range of your proton is also to ensure that the PREC peak, the energy deposition, is in the cancer. So both are really challenges right now uh, in the field we're trying to, to address. So back one is Actium 225. Again, we have that our tracer. But one of the problems is that it's not only actinium. There are actually four alpha particle decay subsequently. And the question is, is, is ultimately your, 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 your actinium and all the daughters staying within, within, your, within your pharmaceutical? Imagine they have alpha particles. Okay, that's always 5 MeV. Okay, that's important. Alpha particles always order 5 MeV. That means they have 5 MeV recoil. Why are they staying there? Like in, in, in a chemical pound, which is only EV. Also, you're changing the chemistry. So there are a lot of questions about the biokinetics. So what we 
So what we are using is the gamma rays associated with Vantium and, and Bismuth to using that to image, okay, to verify the kinetics. So using our double-sided strip germanium detector, and that's Emily Frame's thesis, uh, using the detector we had available and to see what we can do with using coded aperture mask, and not active because it's high resolution, so it's more like a passive mask and combining common imaging in the system. So can we demonstrate, and that has never done before, for near field, like having a mouse with the Actium 22 uh, pharmaceutical, for near field with the coded aperture, can we image on a finite time? And we can we do an estimation of the quantity of how much material? And that has never been done with these modalities for quantum imaging and coded aperture in near field. And the answer is yes. Uh, so Emily Frame was able to do that. So on the left, we see and we work with UC San Francisco, which are very interested in developing of this pharmaceutical. So that Dota YS5. So this is your antibody and this is your linker uh, ligand. Um, so it's specific, uh, uh, again, radio pharmaceutical. And she was able to, in a small animal, so to within an hour in the simple system, to image uh, the tumor and, and uptakes in, in normal organs. For the 280 kV using the coded aperture and 440 kV uh, with the quantum imaging mode, so within an hour. It's not really good enough yet, and also the resolution is only a few millimeters, but it looks very promising, number one, in terms of imaging and sensitivity, but also what she is able to show is that she is able to reconstruct the quantity, like the amount of activity in the tumor and, and, the, and the normal tissue actually fairly accurately. So that's the first time that was possible to do the quantitative reconstruction in near field with these imaging modalities. So quite, quite, quite intriguing that you can do that with, again, good old germanium retardants. So to indicate too much up, I mean, this, this, you can see that already with, like within a few minutes, you were able to see that already the uptake is too much uptake in the, in the, in the normal tissue. And that's really relevant in the development of radio pharmaceuticals. So, so now we are trying to upgrade that system to make the energy resolution better. And, and there are a lot of things we can improve. So that's what we're working on right now. Okay, so I think I need to wrap up, um, even though we have worked on that, but that's uh, do next time. So what I wanted to show you today, again, that there's a lot of developments in radiation detection imaging and in, the, in, in computer vision and contextual sensing, which is really relevant, has been relevant and continues to be relevant and really driving new developments and new, new applications. And these, I think the advanced probably really intriguing opportunities for, for you guys, for the students in the future. Because we are just scratching the surface on these developments. There's much more to be done to utilizing really the enormous advances, again, radiation detection and imaging, Again, that's what we do in our nuclear world, but utilizing the enormous advances in computing, in sensor, machine vision, and computer vision, and ultimately, of course, how to utilize the data you can now obtain, that means machine learning, in terms of feature extraction. And that's for detection problems, but ever more so for estimation problems. And we are, as I said, just scratching the surface. Uncertainty and uh, estimation, quantification is, is a huge area where there needs to be done, a lot of work needs to be done. So it's quite really quite exciting for the next generation of people to not to reinvent the wheel, right? Don't start again with the comp camera, even though you might want to do it in your own lab to understand how it works, but ultimately utilize what has been done over the last 20 plus years in this field and push further. Because also we need to, con and that's cl closing my loop in my, my argument, because on one hand, it's really powerful, the technology for the experts, if something happens, like that you have the expert operator have these state-of-the-art tools available. And as shown you with GRI, the company, it's quite amazing. It's like just push button, like any can op anyone can operate the system. You push the button, it starts to map the world around you automatically, it tracks everything automatically. All of that done is automatically, no expert required. So that's cool. But the fact that you can visualize radiation, as an example, it's really critical in the communication with the public. Because now we can, we can overcome one of the fundamental challenges in the communication about nuclear radiation with the public, not being able to see it. Well, you make it visible now. Imagine 
in Chernobyl or in Fukushima, you would have had this technology and you can show the contamination in the homes or the kindergartens on the schools in the neighborhoods of Fukushima and to show, okay, that's what, what it is. And of course, knowing that this is actually not that much more than it has been before. To be able to have the technology to visualize radiation and then to engage with communities. And that's my, 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 my motivation from the start with our Institute of Resilient Communities, to communicate with, with, the communi with, with, with our communities, but using really most advanced technologies, not just for the sake of the operators and experts, but keeping in mind, well, we might want to use that also in the communication with the public. Because if something happens, this will always be the dominating impact, like the indirect impact, whatever will happen in the nuclear in the future, even Chernobyl in terms of radiation, because it felt it ultimately was essential in the fall of the Soviet Union. Like the side effect of the accident was much, much more than just radiation, even though the radiation, of course, was complete disaster and people, many people died because of radiation. But if you put in the grand scheme, it's really nothing compared to the indirect effects of radiation by the fear and the uncertainty given the radiation. So we should always keep in mind, this will be the main driver if something happens in the future. And we have to be better prepared than we have been in the past. On one hand, using state of the art technologies and for us to engage and learn how to engage with communities, to be a trusted resource in communities, to address their main concerns. And with that, I want to conclude and thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much. It's uh, certainly uh, just scratch the surface of a lot of things going yes. on. But uh, we're a little late on in time. We'll probably have time for a few quick questions. Yes. yes. Uh, very nice. I'm very nice. Uh, I have a question about this. Uh, so you show the, the dog carry your camera into the thing and do the image reconstruction. So in this scenario, we need to have the position of the camera when you imaging this whole things. So how do you get this position for this imaging reconstruction? So excellent question. The question is how can we get the position and the orientation of the system on the yeah. on the dog when while walking to an, an un, un, unknown environment. So that's really the fundamental to that concept. So you might have seen there's a LIDAR, a rota rotating LIDAR. All these systems are uh, equipped with a rotating LIDAR system, like whether it's uh, Velodyne, but Velodyne was, of course, now Oyster. So it's so, so it's uh, there are not that many companies who are providing uh, these rotating lighter. So 1632, 6428 beam lighter systems. So they are doing the mapping of your environment in 3D. Okay, so it's a lighter system which provides the the 3D scene. So that's what you what you see in there. The plaque point cloud that's based on the lighter point cloud, but that allows you also because you know where the lighter is in your point cloud. Okay, that allows you to estimate using SLAM um, to, to, to determine where you are, what orientation you are. Okay, that's to using the point cloud to estimate with SLAM algorithm where you are. Okay, and then you, and since you know that where you are relative to your surface you're creating, you can now back project the radiation from your imager into that, into that world. Okay, so it's using on one hand the LiDAR point clouds for the 3D surfaces in the 3D environment. And using that to with SLAM algorithm to estimate where you are. Okay. Oh yes. Oh yes. Um, so there, there's excellent question. What I just mentioned, all about uncertainties, including the position. So typically, so the lighter itself has has is fairly accurate. It depends on how fast you go and what the density will be. But typically, is is in, in the, and of course the distance, like right? it's all it's all angular uncertainty. So when you're close, we can like um, we can get centimeter resolution. If you go further away, it's like tens of centimeters. So a centimeter, tens of centimeters. That's also consistent with your image reconstruction and the uncertainty, ultimately estimating where you are in this environment. So it's typically centimeter and tens of centimeter. Now for most application, that's quite good enough. Like for some application. Maybe not for safeguards where you really want to like map and reconstruct objects much more accurately, but then you have potentially have more time uh, or not, but it really depends. But typically it's centimeters to tens of centimeters, depending on the distance and your speed. But great question, because all about uncertainties.
Next one. We're going to relate. Probably still can't do it. So you can go back and have a have a dinner. dinner. That too. Yes. I've I've been talking a lot today. Yes. Uh, yeah. Last time, second speaker again. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay.